Meet the Playwright is sponsored by Nick Hearn Books, theatre publishers and performing rights agents. Now, if you're a budding Shakespeare, Bennett, Beckett or Akebourne, then getting started as a playwright might seem like a story without an end. I'm here to meet with Ella Hickson, who's still only in her mid-twenties, but has had four plays professionally produced and won several awards. I'm keen to find out what makes her work so popular. So Ella, thank you for joining us. Your plays are being widely performed by students and amateur groups, and many of them are about the lives of young people. Would you say that that's because, as a young playwright yourself, you identify with them, or do you think there's something interesting about the circumstances of young people today? Uh, I think it's probably just a case of uh, narcissism, in that I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of of that age myself, and, and the lives that I come into contact with most frequently are those of my friends and my contemporaries. And I suppose that, I mean, eight was a very sort of, it was a, portrait, I suppose, of my generation, the, the different sort of things that, that I was looking at and the thematically what was going on in that generation. Um, yeah, and I suppose that that continues to be a preoccupation. It's changing slightly. I'm, I'm writing for a slightly older kind of audience now, but <clears throat> certainly like over the last few years, it's been, it's been the case. I just want to know what's going on as like for people that, that sort of I, I spend time with and people that, that I kind of am fascinated by, which tend to be people that are roughly the same age as me. Now, your first play, Eight, consists of eight monologues by eight different characters, and they can be performed in any combination. How does that work in production? It's relatively tricky, because their audience vote on the way in. We, gave, we used to give them a menu of characters. So they'd be given all eight on kind of this laminated sheet with mm. a very small description of each character. And then they'd be given a voting form, and they'd vote for the four characters of the eight that they wanted to see. And then the votes would be very quickly counted, uh, and the results of those votes would then be run upstairs to the stage uh, manager who would tell the tech guy to order the video relay in the right order. Um, actually, no, would tell the tech guy which four video clips they needed, which four characters were going to be performing, and then the decision would come down to me because I was directing it about what order they were going in. So that was very much my call. So it was a combination of forces happening very, very quickly uh, to try and make sure we had the right people in the right order to satisfy the audience's uh, inclination. And how did the actors feel about that? Not great. I mean, the actors, it was really difficult with the actors because it was such an intense piece. I mean, when we ran it in New York, it was two hours long and they have to sit there, the other seven actors, whilst the one actor is performing, sit completely still on these chairs and face forward. And so it's, it's pretty demanding on them. Um, and they open the show standing in a straight line, totally still as well. So they had to do a lot of kind of static, very focused work. And then there were occasions, obviously, where they'd get told that, they weren't performing and they wouldn't even know that. I mean, they'd get on stage ready and prepped for, for a performance and, and eventually they would sort of discover as, as time whittled on uh, that, that they wouldn't be going up. I mean, we tried to balance it. There was some directorial intervention in as far as if people hadn't been on for quite a few shows consecutively, then we, we tried to sort of, we slightly bent the rules to make sure people <laughs> could go on every now and then just so they didn't hate me and kill me. Um, but it was, yeah, I think it was quite tough on them. They did a really good job though. And the characters in Eight are very varied, aren't they? They include, for instance, an ex-soldier, someone who survived a terrorist incident, and even a well-to-do prostitute. Which of the characters do audiences respond most to, do you find? In terms of the voting, the audience, I have to say, were rather aesthetically driven. Uh, the menu of characters um, had a small photograph of, of each character mm. on it, so the girl with the biggest boobs uh, <laughs> kind of got picked every time. Mm. Um, so that was very much an aesthetic choice and it didn't really tend to come mm. down to um, character description. Once the run went on a bit, some of the characters got better reviews than others just because some of the monologues are more likeable than others. Mm. Uh, so that kind of tended to influence the decisions. And more recently, your play Precious Little Talent has been in the West End, and while two of the characters in this play are young, the third character is a lot older, isn't he? How did you find writing him? And is that a sign of a new perspective in your work? Uh, I hope it's a new direction, is the answer to that. Um, I've written a lot of plays about sort of people in their 20-somethings, and whilst it's been really lovely, and I, I do sort of have a, con a preoccupation with contemporary uh, culture, it's been... It was really nice writing George because I got to look at a different generation that had lived through different things and lived through things that I had never lived through. Uh, so it was a, like a slightly more historical pursuit in terms mm -hmm. of research. 
it wasn't so different to writing uh, younger characters. I mean, you do the same thing that you draw a little bit on your contem on your own world, sort of your biographical experience, which I suppose in terms of that age range is my dad or my friend's dads. Um, and then you do sort of culturally specific research. So it was an Englishman that had gone to live in America and then he had dementia. So there was some kind of medical research mm -hmm. to do there as well. And you knit those things together and then you find a human story in it, which, which hopefully is a universal truth. Uh, and for George, it was about um, not meeting the aspirations you had as a child. And I think even by, like I'm 26, even by my age, you get a sense of the kind of pathos that's involved in, in understanding that you will never be some of the things that you dreamed of being. Now, you've also directed, haven't you, several of your plays yourself, notably Eight and Precious Little Talent and another play called Hot Mess at the Edinburgh Fringe. Have you got any advice for companies staging a show at the Fringe? And how do you create a buzz around performances, particularly when it's a piece of work that nobody knows about yet? Uh, I just did sort of gig nights and art events and, and actually produced theatre um, and comedy for a long time before I, I went into writing it. And so in terms of selling it, I was much more aware of how to do that, I think, than a lot, of, a lot of writers were. So that was very much in the back of my mind with eight. Like, it was intentionally a State of the Nation play, and there was the gimmick of voting, and there was eight, you know, pretty young people that you could put on the front of a poster, and <laughs> all of those kind of things. And when it came to Precious Little Talent, it was slightly more difficult, because it was thematically driven rather than anything else. Um, and we sort of just used the, the kind of the buzz that eight had got and, and carried it through. And by the time it came to Hot Mess, it was kind of back to the drawing board because eight, you know, had been two years previously and it wasn't necessarily going to give that much momentum to Hot Mess. And it was site specific, so it was a real pain in the backside to um, get people down there because it was in a nightclub. And so again, I mean, you just think about what works in terms of marketing and, and we were, it, it was called Hot Mess um, <laughs> for the very clear reason that it was a little bit dirty and a little bit sexy and that makes people see plays. Mm. Um, and so we printed these stickers that said Hot Mess with an arrow and we plastered the whole of the city, Edinburgh, in them <clears throat> right down from the ticket stalls all the way down with this arrow to where the venue was. And people very, very quickly realised that if they just stuck them on their chests they were referring to themselves as a hot mess. Uh -huh. um, which actually, I remember a father coming up to me with a sort of a two-year-old child and being like, could I possibly have one of those for my kids? And I was like, it's a bit <laughs> weird, <laughs> all right. Mm. Um, so you just, I mean, it's the basic principles of marketing, I suppose. The festival is such a commercial beast now that you've really got to have quite, so you've got to have a marketing head on your shoulders mm. um, to be able to sort of understand how to get things seen. Now, moving on to amateur theatre, do you think it's really limited by a lack of funds or are there ways to meet the challenges involved in staging a play without an abundance of cash? I mean, there are certainly ways to meet those challenges. Most of the plays I've ever done at the festival, I've done absolutely on a shoestring. Um, well, I mean, even when we toured it, I mean, when we put eight up in the West End, we were paying salaries. Um, but in terms of set, it was still just a black box, literally one black box on the stage and eight black chairs from Ikea. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there are certainly formats in which you can do that. Every project you do, you have to ask actors to be involved and you have to ask people to give up big chunks of their time. And there is an industry standard for the fact that you should pay those people to do that. Um, amateur work works off an ethos that I think is absolutely unique and should be defended to the hilt that everybody is there because they want to be there. Mm -hmm. And there's a kind of passion and excitement and dedication in that room that you don't necessarily get in professional environments because people are on a paycheck. So there's a philosophical problem there, essentially, that you want the passion and you want the excitement, but people at the end of the day, in order for it to be an industry, have to make wages out of it. And, and people have a sense of self-respect that they should stick to, that they are producing work that is, is worth being paid for. Um, so it's difficult. I, I think funding restrictions, as far as amateur work goes, should be seen as creative inspiration. I think if you've got restricted funds in terms of set, in terms of lighting and everything else, it just means that your writing and your acting have to be that bit better and indeed your direction has to be superb. And I think they're good challenges for people early in their career. And so what else are you working on that we should look out for? Um, so I've got quite a few things going on at the moment. I'm developing uh, three TV projects at the moment. Uh, one is a kind of murder mystery uh, based on um, a sort of psycho... psycho ecological condition called emotional synesthesia, which is mildly scientific, mildly not. Um, uh, something to do with a uh, British girl in New York and also uh, a sort of a serial about um, a plane crash called Last Words. Could you live with your last words? Who knows? Um, 
so that's the three, three TV projects. I've just recorded my first radio play, which is called Rightfully Mine, which is about a daughter that asks her mother to be surrogate for her, which was a lovely process. Radio is great. Um, and last weekend I recorded my first short film as well, which is currently titled Hold On Me, but I think that's going to change, which is with a director called Sam Abrahams, um, BAFTA nominated director who's brilliant. He's a really, really good guy. And so that was really good fun to do. Um, in the future, I've got uh, there's a play being called Boys being developed by Headlong, theatre-wise. Um, I'm writing a new play about an oil rig, and then I'm writing a shorter kind of weeny fun play for myself, which is sort of looking at uh, contemporary feminism. So do you have a favourite medium now that you've worked in so many? Well, theatre is where, no, where my heart and brain are. Um, TV is, is very exciting, though. Ella, thank you so much for joining us and good luck with those projects. Thank you very much.